honestly, both because of Wesleyanism and because of my the experience of my parents, I've always seen society as something that was plastic, like something that could be molded or shaped. And that's why we have to keep showing up in the public square. Hi, everyone. This is Dana Black. And this is Chelsea Simon. Welcome Welcome to to the Collective Table. Hi, everyone. It's Dana. We are a little over halfway through our second season of What God Looks Like. I don't know about you, but for me, this has been a profound and hopeful journey. I'm going to be honest, I'm 46 years old, and there have been moments, especially over the past 16 months, heck, over the past several years, where I have seriously wrestled and have been frustrated with God. I found myself asking God, what the hell is going on? Is this what your creation has amounted to? The violence, the death, the dehumanization of the other, the focus on the individual. As Chelsea and I have interviewed, talked to, and created relationships with all of the guests, God answered me back. Here you go, Dana. Just stop and listen to my children. Hear their stories. Hear their hope. Hear their conviction to make my creation better for all of my children. Hear the future. Our guest this week continues to be God's answer to my question. Pastor, author, theologian, and activist Reverend Tyler Sitt joins Chelsea and I for a conversation about faith, justice, community, and action. Tyler is the pastor at New City Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It is a church community that is committed to a space for people who do not get a chance to be heard in the broader society. It is a church that is run by queer people of color. It is a church that believes in a new city where all tribes are welcomed in, where there is no more violence, and where the whole earth is renewed. Tyler recently released his first book, Staying Awake, The Gospel for Changemakers, where he shares reflections and stories about showing up for justice and staying in the movement. Whether it's in worship, prayer, or in our groups, there is an invitation to stay awake, to love, to gratitude, and to wholeness. You are not going to want to miss this conversation. After listening, check out tylersit.com to purchase the book, and then also go to grownewcity.church to learn more about this community. Sit back, relax, and listen as we hear from Tyler. Let's just dive into this discussion with Tyler. We're so excited to have you. And if you could maybe just kick off and tell us maybe your five-minute synopsis, if it's possible, about your background and what faith tradition you were raised in. Sure. Yeah. Born and raised United Methodist. uh, Grew up in Richfield United Methodist Church. Loved it. Um, My dad is an immigrant from Hong Kong. And my mom is a white woman from Minnetonka, Minnesota. Okay, you guys, Minnesota. And they met at the University of Minnesota at a disco dancing class. So I... A disco dancing class. That's amazing. I I owe my life to disco. So (laughs) We need disco music right now. Cue it. (laughs) Yeah. So like, I don't know. I think... It was, it's a confluence of a lot of things. Um, the, the United Methodist Church was a place where I felt deep love and deep investment. It's a place where I could ask questions about God. And I also um, just kind of throughout my childhood had this like deep sense that the work of humans, the work of what it means to be alive has to have impacts outside of the church and not just in, in outside of the church building that is. And not just inside the church building, because uh, I'm the child of an interracial marriage. And my parents, like, when they put their wedding announcement in the newspaper, they got death threats, like the kind where like people like cut out letters of magazines and paste it together. I don't know, it just was like such a veil over my childhood. And I think my parents taught me through experiences like that, like, you know, Tyler, sometimes society gets it wrong. And like the reason why we go to church, the reason why 
we participate in like things that make the world a better place is because society gets it wrong sometimes. And so I think from an early age, honestly, both because of Wesleyanism and because of my, the experience of my parents, I've always seen society as something that was plastic, like something that could be molded or shaped. Uh, and, and that's why we have to keep showing up in the public square. How has it, how has it evolved or transformed? And you mentioned Wesleyanism and it may be just because some people may not know who John right. Wesley is or, um, so maybe if you could talk a little bit how your faith evolved and infuse that into it. Yeah. So, um, John Wesley, along with his brother, Charles and his mom, Susanna, uh, had, were kind of like the, uh, the, um, I don't think they would describe themselves as pioneers, but like the, the, he started a spiritual movement that eventually became United Methodism. And, and uh, there were certain markers of the theology in Wesleyanism that um, have really shaped United Methodism, uh, a lot of emphasis on grace. Uh, salvation is something that begins before you're born and continues till after you die. Like it's not just one moment, it's like your whole life. Um, cool stuff like that. So, <laughs> um, and I forgot the the rest of the question. That's what Wesleyanism is. What was the rest of the question? I think how has it evolved for you from from growing up in the church as this, as a little kid? And then how did it evolve and become like real for you as an adult participating in the world that becomes a pastor? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, and I and I hear my friends who are parents of young children confirm this. I think that all kids are mystics. Like all kids, kind of start off with just like kind of a, a greater spiritual awareness of God and like a sensitivity to it. And I definitely have memories of like going around and opening up all the windows in my house, and my parents are like, "What are you doing?" And I was like, I want to see God. Like, you know, there was, I've always kind of had this like intuitive connection, uh, experiential knowing of God. And I think that when I realized that I was gay, that was a huge, huge, like life stabilizer for me. Cause I knew that I was gay, but I also knew that I could like have direct prayerful contact with God and whatever society kind of threw at me, there was a certain like resilience in that. And so I think that there was from the get go, there was kind of a trial by fire <laughs> ethic of, of my approach to faith. And, and then as I got older, um, yeah, I went to college and I really felt like the Christianity that I had grown up with had not prepared me for the experience of, I, I, w I went away from college. I was all by myself. There was a lot of emotions. There was a lot of adulting, figuring stuff out. And I just felt like I wasn't spiritually prepared for this. So I started um, sitting meditation at the Zen, at the Cambridge Zen Center. I started um, getting really into um, Zen thought, the Zen Buddhist thought. Fast forward, uh, all the way until like the very end of my seminary career, I sent, I spent a semester living in the Tibetan Buddhist community of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and then uh, go over to France to do a 40 day mindfulness retreat with uh, Thich Nhat Hanh in a Plum Village. And I realized in those very gracious, amazing experiences that I'm not a Buddhist. <laughs> like I realized in those experiences, like, wow, I'm super Christian and I wasn't exposed to a branch of Christianity th that was contemplative and mystical. And so I kind of like outsourced my inner life to Buddhism because I, my soul needed some type of contemplative practice. But once I realized that there is a contemplative branch of Christianity as well. And actually it's like a very important branch of Christianity. Uh, I, and it's been uh, around I, for a I long realized. time. <laughs> and like, okay, ever since Jesus <laughs> went on a mountain to pray, there's been contemplative Christians. And I just, <laughs> um, I just feel like my soul kind of found its song and, and that was contemplative Christianity. I feel like your experience of coming out what is different than a lot of people's you kind of like felt it as like this grounding thing where people 
I think maybe typically feel it as like rocks the boat, but because of your faith, it kind of like, it sounds like it kind of grounded you or gave you, I don't know. Yeah, it absolutely did. And, and that, you know, this is one of the perks of growing up with a Christianity that didn't have purity culture or conservative evangelicalism in it mixed into it. So I just would like, came to understand God as a God of love and as a God who like, can't wait to be in relationship with God's kids. And, uh, and I never like had the same coupling of sexuality with shame as a lot of my queer siblings. And I do see that as a dimension of privilege. Like there's just like a whole mess of whole basket of trauma that I don't have to sort through that. Like a lot of other queer people do. So I, I also born and raised United Methodist. So I, I, I actually re- what you say, I resonate with quite a bit, especially as it relates to the c- contemplative mystic um, mm. lack of in, in, in my faith growing up and now really discovering it and, and feeding into it in the United Methodist community I'm in now. Um, but as it relates to your sexuality, like one of the questions I have, even in the United Methodist Church, you're right. I don't. I didn't grow up with a purity culture. I didn't grow up kind of with this evangelical, but I do push back a little bit with the United Methodist because I think it was just never something we ever talked about. Like we just never really yeah. talked about sexuality. And you're right. We grew up with love. We grew up with grace, but nobody ever talked about what sexuality would look like. And now that's such have- a good observation. Yeah. And now we just have like a bunch of people who are like causing some real harm because there's right. like, like the privileges of being an adult, <laughs> but without the kind of like wherewithal to know how to navigate that as a Christian. Yeah. That's a really good point. I definitely had to learn how to like actually live out my sexuality from not the church. And, <laughs> and, I, and I think that we could have done some like real good work if if we had been able to talk about sexuality and and not only talk about it but to see more open conversations between adults at church about what sexuality uh in a non-shame based but still like christian ethic looks like yeah i 100 percent agree yeah i think it's a huge opportunity for all churches but definitely in the united methodist denomination now yeah mm-hmm. So now you go through seminary and you have a call to church plan. Is that how that works? Was that right out of seminary? Oh, you want to, you have something up? Well, no, I wanted to kind of on top of that, like where did, so you come, you, you ultimately decide that um, you're not Buddhist, that you really want to practice Christianity. Um, how, where do you, where does your call come from and how do you decide, do you go to seminary right away? What, what did that look like? So I think I'm, I'm tagging on to her, just kind of curious how that transition all happened. Oh, sure. Yeah. So the call to ministry came in high school. It was like way before. Um, I, a lot of my career has been shaped by just like wise mentors who have spoken truth in my life. And so one day I was uh, at home uh, helping my mom cook dinner and I was like chopping a carrot or something. And my mom was like, my mom has a pretty significant Minnesotan accent. And my mom was like, you know, Tyler, um, have you ever thought about doing what Pastor Robert does on Sunday? And I like stopped chopping and was like, I should do what Pastor Robert does on Sunday. Like there, it was just like spoken into my life by someone who saw me operate in the world and was like, you know, I could really see you do this. And it was one of those, like, once it was spoken into my life, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And uh, I was like, right away uh, in applying to college, like, I'm applying to college in order to go to seminary. Like, I'm getting my undergrad simply to be able to get my master's in divinity. And, uh, And it was a pretty... If for considering how many continents I jumped between, it was actually a pretty direct straight shot to, to seminary and ministry uh, because I, I just knew like there's a certain type of change that I want to affect in the world and ministry is the place for me to exercise that um, because my belief in Jesus and my experience of God is part of my theory of change. So if I was, I just kind of felt like if I, 
you know, like God bless social workers, God bless uh, community organizers and activists. And I have trainings and a bunch of those things, but like ultimately Jesus is part of my theory of change. And if I can't create spaces that like practice the love of Jesus, then we're going to be a long ways off, or at least I'm, I'm not going to be able to live into my calling, I should say. And uh, so, yeah, it, it just was like, it was and is as obvious as, you know, looking out the window. Mm-hmm. And is is that why when you were practicing Buddhism, it's like you couldn't shake Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. It was like, boy, and I'm so grateful for the Buddhists in my life. They put up with so much of me going through all sorts of things. And like just teaching this like hyper Enneagram seven to like sit down is like already a feat in itself. But um, I always felt like, man, this meditation is so helpful. It, but it doesn't, to, to my experience, it doesn't feel like the fullness of what my soul is longing for. Like it feels like a great practice that people should just learn how to do to function as a human, but it doesn't feel like kind of like a, a holistic whole person, whole society solution to the future that I feel called toward. I totally hear you on the the Jesus thing. My mom was just in town and not surprised that I'm a pastor, but I was like, you know, even if I wanted to shake Jesus, which I don't, but even if I did, I just can't because I really, really like him. Like I, like, I, <laughs> yes. think, I really think he's cool <laughs> and like, cool. I don't, I just really like Jesus. Like, I just think that he understood how to be human. Like, I don't, the fullness of human. And like, I just, I hear you on that. Uh, I I just really liked it. That's awesome, Chelsea. He's a cool cool guy. guy. (laughs) I want to text him every day. You know, I, and honestly, like as a queer person, as an Asian American, growing up in a predominantly white society, like I have felt more consistently seen and heard in experiences of prayer and spiritual practice than I have for like most of the social interactions that I have on a day-to-day basis. So like there is a real like, like deep longing for God that um, I I just couldn't shake, you know, like Jesus, uh, I'm a big fan. (laughs) (laughs) Number one fan. We need the t-shirts. Jesus freaks. We need those t-shirts. Yes. Yes. I do explain myself as a Jesus freak from that DC talk song, you know, in the nineties and people are like, don't say that. I'm like, but I am like, I am. I I don't even think it's a bad (laughs) thing. But like literally though. (laughs) And I don't think it's bad. I'm so much of a Jesus freak that I dedicated my whole life, career, lifestyle and daily ritual to that so I don't know what else <laughs> right I could do that would constitute as being yeah so right, right. yeah no I hear you I hear you let's talk about New City Church and and it's a church plant um and I am so curious about a variety of things because again growing up United Methodist and kind of being in the Methodist community now we don't see a lot of church plants at least I feel like I haven't um so I'm just kind of curious I think we're kind of curious is how does this all come about? What does this look like? How do you get it started? Yeah. So in my uh, book, uh, Staying Awake, the Gospel of Changemakers, I name nine kind of like key practices for Christianity. And the ninth one I name as, or I'm sorry, the eighth one I name as planting. And a lot of my Methodist colleagues were like, is it <laughs> like planting? Because we do if it's an essential Christian rhythm, like we don't do it that often. And <laughs> they're like, uh-oh, what, is, what does that tell you? But I think that um, it's just so uh, obvious to me <laughs> as someone who is part of both the queer community and the Asian American Pacific Islander community, like I see marginalized people needing to create spaces just out of survival, really, like, um, just like noticing that society has not accounted for us. We need to create our own space and then like having to cobble together community from that. And, uh, and I see that happening all over the place and it's like, well, so if the church is going to center marginalized voices or if if the church is going to be in relationship and ministry with not just to, but with marginalized voices, 
then that probably means that we're going to be church planting because society isn't built to create spaces where marginalized people can flourish. So like, I, I just feel like it's, <laughs> it might not be church planting. Like I am planting a 5,000 member worshiping congregation that with like a full staff, but planting just meaning like you're starting something new that is disruptive to the spaces available to the society that you're living in. Um, and, and so that might be like meetings in your garage. That might mean meetings in restaurants. That might mean like an online group. Like all of that is planting because all of that is an act of resistance against the empire or the kind of the forces of like hatred, evil, and domination that Jesus came to uproot. And, and therefore like all of it is profoundly Christian. So in your church planting, when you were getting ready to, to plant this church, what was important for you to keep in the forefront? Like if you, you're trying to create a community that is not being, is out there. Um, so what does that look like? Yeah. Um, so I sat down and wrote down a list of non-negotiables for my calling. And basically what I said was like, you know, I, you know, in the beginning I did a a prayer walk through every neighborhood in Minneapolis. I was talking to a lot of people, a lot of, I encountered a lot of different agendas and people who wanted to recruit me for different things. So I needed to come down and say like, what are the things that I know must be true for my calling to be part of my calling? And there was very few parts of it. It was, um, one, uh, it has to, whatever the next thing is, it has to be Christian. Uh, so like, again, Jesus is part of my theory of change. So like, we need to be able to talk about Jesus in whatever format that might be. Two, um, it has to do something with the environment or creation. I did um, some climate change activism in a previous era of my life. And I just really, really care about the planet from a theological place. Like we learn a lot about God through the planet. So that was really important to me. And and whether it was recycling bins or solar panels or urban gardening, I didn't care. Like I, it just had to do something with the planet. Third was um, I am really passionate about multiracial community building and multiethnic community building because I saw how well it can go in my family. <laughs> like my uh, two... Uh, sides of my family come together and when they did like some really interesting unique things happened that wouldn't have happened if they had not otherwise so I um uh thoroughly believed in that oh and then lastly it was just about um uh the Twin Cities area like I felt called to be in Minnesota um after spending a lot of time out of state so I so that those were my that was it though like I I kind of like walked around and talked to a ton of people and was kind of like, okay, God, whatever you want from those other things, like just let us know. Like I've discerned as much as I could from God in those four non-negotiables and everything else will just be like a make it as you make the plane as you fly it kind of thing. And that was what the process looked like. It was kind of like, were living into this or did you have a really strict structure you needed to follow or how did like the pieces come together? Yeah. Um, so I did a church planting residency at urban village church in Chicago, just to learn how to church plant. And then I spent the last time, I, the residency is a year long and I actually was at urban village for eight months, I think. And then I moved back to Minnesota just to do networking. So not like overt, I'm planting a church, but just trying to meet people because I haven't, I hadn't been here for like about a decade. Um, So uh, making as many contacts as I can, connecting with like-minded people, people who are passionate about what I'm passionate about, um, doing a prayer walk through every neighborhood in Minneapolis. And eventually I um, felt really called to a neighborhood called Powderhorn in South Minneapolis. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, I moved out of my, I re- <laughs> I was in my parents' place and then I crashed with a United Methodist pastor for a summer. And so I moved out of that basement and into an apartment in Powderhorn. And I just started having people over for like 
lasagna dinner every Friday and just kind of see if there was any traction in this. And as I kept expanding my networks, I eventually was able to um, start compensating one of my friends from seminary, actually, who was really good at small group stuff. And us tag teaming kind of created some prototypes of small groups. And then those grew. And, uh, and then, yeah, I'm super fast forwarding. But like, then we do quarterly worship. And then we do monthly worship. And then we do a lot of surveys. And then we get a lot of commitment from people. And then we launched a weekly worship service in November 2017. And then, uh, and then here we are. <laughs> and and so this, this is, um, I, I'm fascinated by all of this, partly because we're in the United Methodist denomination and I'm trying to always figure out how does that structure work? Cause it's, it's, you know, the United Methodist is such a structured process, right? And, and because it's a global denomination, the entire denomination owns the properties they own. It's, you could go on to this forever. So w- I'm kind of curious. One is how much support did you get from the, the, the United Methodist Church, just b- both, like, were you a part of them? Were you not a part of them? Is this completely independent? And then I think, well, I'll let you answer that first. Yeah, no, I, I was, I was uh, very much doing this as part of my uh, work as a United Methodist, for sure. And one of the things that conferences can do to kind of incentivize planting is to just make it real simple to start planting. So I was appointed to plant and uh i had a it was one of those like um i had a half time compensation from the conference but they were they gave me full time uh benefit they considered it full time to be able to give me benefits and full time pension accrual so like i you know i was like 20 what, like 25 or whatever at the time. Like I didn't need a ton of money. I was, <laughs> I had a ton of roommates, whatever. And it was, um, it was just really easy to get going. Well, interestingly, one of the things that a lot of church planters do, um, if they want to do like a, I don't know if I love this, but like a, a mother daughter style of church plant where there's kind of like a mentor established church that kind of takes this other church under their wing. A lot of times churches do that. And I, uh, there was initially like five congregations who were potential kind of parent churches for New City. And we ended up not creating a collaboration with any of them because we didn't feel like there was a strong enough DNA match. There wasn't a strong enough like alignment between values that we felt like it would eventually actually turn into a counterproductive process. And our odds were better off with me just kind of going at it by myself. Um, yeah. So that, that's what I think I'm familiar with is kind of this parent child relationship where sure. one particular established church community says, okay, we'll go ahead and, and support this other one for a period of time. That makes sense. Got it. Okay. Which so frankly is what we're doing right now. Right. And exactly. um, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. But I do, but I, um, we're, we're new in this, we were going to be a gathered community actually. And then COVID hit and we moved online and, you know, this has all unfolded from there. Um, but I hear you in some of the, um, red flags that might pop up. I hear you on that. There is research that suggests that if a church plant can have something like a parent community, their chances of, of success are a lot higher um, but it ha- there has to be uh, kind of like a missionally aligned uh, parent church or like just a lot of clarity of boundaries. Like you are giving us this, you have this type of influence. That is the end of it. Like mom, get out of my room. You know, like, you're like, just like, <laughs> like you're a parent, but like, you're not a helicopter. Like you, uh, you uh, can't read my diary. Room. Like right? don't read my diary, mom. Yeah. Get out of my phone. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I just think, um, especially, you know, Minnesota is hugely predominantly white and Minneapolis and the Twin Cities are all also still majority white. And I, I just felt like for the purposes of multi-ethnic community building, even if I got like a bunch of volunteers from another church, I would need those volunteers because most of the churches around here are white congregations. I would need those volunteers to do mostly behind the scenes stuff because like it's really intimidating for like 
a Latinx person to walk into a room and there's like 15 white people and then one of them. <laughs> and like, like that already creates a power dynamic that is not helpful for diverse community building. So like whenever people did want to volunteer, it was like, hey, could we use your printer? Could we, could you like write thank you cards to donors? Could you set up chairs? Could you shovel the sidewalk? And not as much like, you know, face-to-face interaction. Well, and I think you also want to, um, as people are coming into the physical um, space, you want you want them to have opportunities to serve right there. And that's how you're building mm-hmm. that community. And so if you're mm-hmm. bringing in other volunteers to do that, they don't have that opportunity to do that. I love that you said that. And you're naming something that's really important. It's almost like... Uh, uh, the the blessing becomes the curse uh, because folks who receive a lot of support at the beginning of planting sometimes don't lean enough into the community. And so then the community goes to this church for like a year and they're like, wow, I didn't have to try that hard and all of church happened. So that must mean that church must not take a lot of effort. And meanwhile, it's the reason why church was happening is because of like volunteers or because of a huge grant from whatever supporting body. So I think uh, one of the things of a church planter is to really every time that the folks are gathering to remind folks like this is uh, in order for this community to be a sustaining thing, like this is what that looks like from you. And we're not going to pressure you into any type of like forced decision or any type of manipulation, nothing like that. But like, there needs to be some informed decision making about how you're prioritizing this community. Yeah, I, that's a lesson for us. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I once had I once had a mentor who every time she'd have like a dinner party, she she wouldn't cook dinner. Like you had to come in and you got a job. And yeah. the, the shared ownership is such a model for how I believe church is to be. Like it doesn't happen unless we're all in it. And like, I think that that's like the, a healthy way of like being church, you know, it's like we, we're we all needed. And if you're not here, that thing doesn't get done. So you need to be here. So that thing gets done. Absolutely. This is, I mean, just as a kind of a, an aside, um, every once in a while, um, we'll get it like an intern or someone from the, someone kind of newer into the community, ask the staff, like, why are we asking women of color to read scripture like hasn't the world taken enough from women of color why can't this this just be an experience that we create for them and then they get to like rest and enjoy that and then leave and um i i totally disagree (laughs) with that sentiment for exactly what you're naming chelsea like the church isn't actually creating a space where people's spirits can grow if there isn't some type of purchase or some type of like footholds for people to contribute to the community And of course, we want to be like appropriate in how we're asking that and do it from like a trauma informed way and knowing like the experience of a black woman in the Twin Cities is going to be really different from the experience of a white man. Um, But nonetheless, like everyone's got to be doing something. Otherwise, it's hard to create that real soul transformation that we're dedicated to. Well, I mean, and that's that's a great point. I'm just I'm. I'm currently in seminary at Duke Divinity and I'm in a worship mm -hmm. class. Yeah. I'm in a worship class and we're talking about the congregation or the attendees or the, the, they're really participants in this experience to worship God. And and we're doing it together as a community. It's not like they're just sitting back and being entertained. And so, because that doesn't create community. It doesn't create a dialogue that you're having with God or giving people the opportunity to encounter the Holy yeah. Spirit in that sacred space, you know? Yeah. 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 Like imagine, okay, this is not a perfect metaphor for obvious reasons, but if I were to like, uh, if I was, if I knew someone was like, Oh my gosh, uh, you're single, this person's single, you would be great together. Let me set you up on a date. And then like, I set you up on a date and then like I set up the whole, uh, meal and all of the chairs and all the surrounding this so romantic. And then I see like, you're not, starting any conversation. So then I write down conversation prompts and hand it to you. And then like, actually you're not saying any of the conversation. So I like create recordings of myself and then put it in, you know, like, like how much work, 
how at, at some point we can like over right uh, oh we can gosh, we can yes. we are we're taking away the experiential encounter with god if we're right. just like over yeah curating everything absolutely um, so i think i do think that there is power in worship to say like hey uh so we've done work to create a sacred space and now it's your turn to lean in to and to truly expect that the spirit will show up and in your book, you talk about worship as love training. And like, this is where we train ourselves to, to, to be in the world, how, like to serve and to use our gifts and the honor that it is to do those things. And so if you're not giving people the opportunity to practice in worship, like, how are they going to, tra- it's like going to the gym and watching people work out, right? It's not going to help <laughs> you. <laughs> right? Like, like, uh, <laughs> like, you might learn some things along the way, but when you're out in the world and you need to do some heavy lifting because life gives you heavy lifting, that's when you start to notice the lack of training. Right. Yeah. I love that. Um, And yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that that calling it love training, by the way, has helped a lot of folks who don't identify as Christian, which like 40% of new city doesn't actively identify as Christian. Calling it love training is kind of like, Oh, okay. 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 So that's how I'm supposed to relate to this space. That's what I was going to say. Let's let's just dive into to the book too, and, and talk about how that was birthed and it, and it emerged, and and talk about what is love training. Like, so let's explain to people what this is because it is a wonderful word. Hmm. So, um, New City, um, multiracial community it has the same racial demographics of the city of Minneapolis, almost to the percentage point in terms of white, black, Latinx, and Asian populations. Um, we don't have a ton of, uh, of, we do have two native members, but it's not proportional to the, to Minneapolis. And we don't have a lot, uh, Minneapolis is home to a ton of, um, Somali immigrants and there's not very many Somali immigrants in New City. So I say that to say like, uh, New City represents the city of Minneapolis in some key ways. And also like we're continuing to strive to minister with other communities. Um, we're almost entirely millennial and Gen Z. Um, there's like my parents who drive <laughs> to be part of church or tune in, but like, uh, not, a, not a ton of folks from older generations, even though we love it when folks from older generations show up and yeah, 40% of new city doesn't actively identify as Christian. So a lot of the theology and, uh, preaching that I do, it comes in assuming that people are both extremely intelligent and extremely unaware of what anything that Christianity is about. (laughs) So it's like, I, I, it's not just like children's church (laughs) where it's super dumbed down. It's like, I'm trying to explain this in a way, knowing that the folks in my community are also like activists and professors and teachers and, and running for elected official, like, like really smart people who um, have only kind of a, a caricature of Christianity from media. So so, so a lot of the book came out of that context where I was like preaching and teaching and folks were coming up to me after church saying like, I thought I had slammed the door shut on Christianity and now I'm at New City Church and I'm looking around and experiencing this and now it's like a little crack. Oh, like the door is not open, but it's like the door is like a little open. So tell me, Tyler, who should I be reading? And don't you dare recommend like a cisgender straight white guy. I d- like just don't need more of those in my life. And so I was like, sure, uh, let me look at my bookshelf. And I, uh, as uh, as you're experiencing at Duke, I'm sure, like tons of amazing like womanist black liberation texts. Like love, love, love those. Also, those are written at like a very ivory tower <laughs> academic level. Like those are not accessible books to a lot of lay people and i had a lot of like memoirs of of people in church um deconstructing reconstructing but all of that assumed that people knew what church was or knew like why we were read the bible or why we worshiped and so it was more a critique of those existing things rather than explaining it and i just felt like uh I can't assume that people know why we pray or why we worship or why we meet in small groups. So I'm going to try to like construct a, a, a primer that centers queer people of color 
uh, in, in just a, a ground zero kind of explanation of these nine, nine practices. And so that, that's where the book came from. And um, like, because I really wanted this to be an active community, there's also testimonies from the community um, of people experiencing this. I included illustrations that I've used at New City uh, because I am a very visual learner. There's poetry from the community. So it, it really arose from a particular people in a particular context who felt like they had something to share with the rest of the world. I think you're speaking exactly about our audience, like where we are, our audience is totally the, we are, the door is almost closed on Christianity. I've been hurt. It's been hypocritical or it hasn't been relevant enough, or it has been, you know, ivory tower. This book is totally for people who like, that's exactly who it's for. It's, it's accessible, but it's not dumbed down. That's, and that's a hard balance to like walk that line. And I, it, you just do a really, and I, I actually got to watch a couple of your sermons um, that were online and you really, you really walk that line really well. Um, like I was like, yeah, this is what people, it's a foreign thing to people, you know, that have never stepped foot in a church. Like this is weird. I think you say in the book, it's like church is awkward. Yeah. Yeah. It really it's is. So awkward. Awkward. <laughs> Especially if you're new and by yourself and like, it's yeah. Yeah, like, it, and we do these weird things that are are countercultural for a purpose. But if you don't know the purpose, it, it's hard to bridge those things. Absolutely, like you're getting into a room, you're singing to the air, you're reading a book that's like way older than anything you've read. Like, it couldn't be more awkward. And like, once I've got, you know, once people get into it, they realize it couldn't be more necessary. So, like. I think that a lot of a pastor in the 21st century's first job is to bridge that gap right there. Yeah. Um, I want to be, you know, sensitive to, to where we are in, in the, in the time and the space. And, um, and, and we always tend to, as we're wrapping things up, ask people, ask our guests, um, where do you see the church? What's your hope for the church in the future? What does that hope look like for you? I think we are in such an uh, an opportune moment for the church right now. Like there's so many trappings. Like New City Church for sure wouldn't exist if we planted even 10 years earlier. Like there's so many conditions that are, are arising both in our society and in our denomination that like are giving space for more creative expressions of things. Of course, there's like tons of stress with it. Of course, there's like mortgages and boilers and all that stuff to think about. But ultimately, I think that we are in kind of a golden moment for ch for church planting. And uh, and our, the the thing that is holding us back is not a lack of resources or even a lack of people, but a lack of imagination of what we what God can do in this time. And our task to, of planting is to is to experimentally dream big about what God can do in our communities. Tyler, I, I, I first uh, heard of your work through um, Fresh Expressions when you when you, New City was starting. And I re-found you for, um, for Lib Liberation Project. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I have to say the first one I watched, I think it was Holy Week. And I just saw you like dancing around, like you were starting and it was like dancing around and like, and then all of a sudden it was like, real truth, like hard stuff. And I have to read you this quote because I just am reminded of you when I, when I hear this quote. <laughs> a Christian, while, fully, while engaging fully in the tears of this world, is ultimately distinguished through his or her laughter. And I think that you, um, uh... as, a, as a seven, as you mentioned, the joy is there, but the depth is there. And so I, you're just such a gift to the church and um, oh. the book is such a gift. And so we're grateful for the time and really uh, encourage people to check out new cities online or um, or or the book Staying Awake. So um, thank you for your time in the middle of annual conference. We appreciate it. Thank you both. <laughs> and, and God bless every person who's listening to this. Um, God is up to something really good right now. So uh, give a listen. Stay awake. <laughs> Stay awake. That's right. Thank you so much for listening. 
Just like everyone we are interviewing throughout this series reflects the sacred and holy image of God, so do you. Together, we are what God looks like. The Collective Table is supported by San Diego United Methodist Church in Encinitas, California. A big thank you to the team at Castos, especially our producer, Stuart Barefoot, and our content editor, Claire Watson. The original music heard in this episode was created and performed by Mystic Mercy. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast, YouTube channel, and our newsletter. If you'd like to financially support the work of The Collective Table, please visit thecollectivetable.org. There you can also find out more about who we are and view past episodes.